All right. Uh, sorry it's so hot in here, but there's nothing I can do about it. Today we are going to talk about Gödel's incompleteness theorems, uh, which I don't know, maybe you've heard about before. Here's a picture of Gödel looking stressed. Uh, but actually, that's just because he proved the theorems in the wrong way. If you know something about computer science, which we do now, this theorems are not that hard. We'll prove them today, no problem. So here's uh, Turing saying, don't worry about it, it's easy. In fact, it's uh, so easy that you know, I'm just going to kill the first third of the lecture by reviewing material from previous lectures. So I'll just literally put up some slides from like lectures from long ago. OK, so this is what I want to tell you today. It's easy if you use computer science. And actually, it's, it's very cool because it's a very uh, nice example of ideas from theoretical computer science having application to like just math. So I mean, we'll prove this great theorem of mathematics using a computer science perspective. And as I said, uh, I'll first spend some time like reviewing some older material. OK, so this was lecture three. It was a long time ago. We've come so far. Uh, here's another picture of Gödel when he was younger. Uh, OK, so logic. So you remember first order logic. Uh, it was this logic where you had things like for all and there exists. And you had these uh, constant names and relation names and function names. And uh, given these relation and function constant names, which are called vocabularies, some sentences we called pathologies. These are sentences that are just automatically true for purely logical reasons. It doesn't matter what interpretation you have. They're just automatically true. So for example, something like, uh, if this you know, is cool C, that implies that there exists some X such that is cool X. I mean, that's just automatically true. It doesn't matter what is cool means or what C means. OK, or if, if everything is equal to A, then next of A is equal to A. That's also a tautology. Now, you remem remember, towards the end of that lecture, I told you about Gödel's completeness theorem from 1929. It was his master's thesis, uh, which showed the following. There's a computable deductive calculus for tautologies. I'll remind you about computable in a little later, but what's this deductive calculus? It's basically like if you open up a textbook, you'll see like some basic set of rules and like axioms of logic. Um, it doesn't matter exactly how you formalize it, but basically it comes with a bunch of axioms, all of which are obviously tautologies. And there's one deduction rule. If you have A, A is a tautology, and A implies B is a tautology, then you can deduce that B is also a tautology. OK, so starting from these axioms and applying these deduct this deduction rule, you can build up a bunch of sentences, all of which are tautologies. And Gödel's amazing theorem actually showed that this gives you all the tautologies. Okay? If, anything, if you have a sentence that's a tautology, it's sort of automatically true, no matter what the interpretation is, then you can derive it from this basic system. Yes? Oh, I thought you had a question. I guess not. OK. Uh, actually, here's one small note. Did you have a question? OK, there's one small note that I do want to bring up. It's mildly annoying, but actually, uh, the seductive calculus does not have finitely many axioms, but it has like finitely many axiom rules or schema. Okay? So for example, uh, if A is any sentence at all, then A or not A is an axiom in this system. Okay? And actually, that's infinitely many axioms, because you're allowed to put in any sentence A you want here. But it's called an axiom schema because it's simple. I mean, if I give you some long sentence, you can tell if it's of the form A or not A. Okay? So you can uh, easily check whether or not it's an axiom, even though there's infinitely many of them. And actually, that's what I mean here when I say computable. Uh, it just means there's an algorithm such that given a sentence, it tells whether or not it's an axiom, you know, given these axiom schema. OK, so this is not a super important point, but it's, uh, you know, it just says that you're not allowed to have like infinitely many crazy axioms. OK. So what is the upshot of this completeness theorem? The upshot is the following. Uh, there's an algorithm, a fixed algorithm, which if you give it a sentence S as an input, which is a tautology, this algorithm will find a deduction of it in this deductive calculus. Why? Uh, or how does it work? Well, it just works like this. You see, Gödel's theorem tells us that there is some deduction of it. If it's of really a tautology. And so you just have to try, like brute force, try all deductions. So you just go for k equals 1, 2, 3, up, et cetera. And for all strings of length k, 
just check if x is a valid deduction of this sentence in the deductive calculus. OK, so this is something I want you to remember. Is there any question about that? I guess you've had a few months to digest it, so we can go on. <clears throat> OK, a few more things I want to remind you of from lecture three. Uh, the set of tautologies is interesting, but it's not that interesting. How do you usually use first order logic? You use it to like help you formalize the reasoning you do about something you care about, like Euclidean geometry or arithmetic or set theory. So the way it's typically used in math is you think of something you want to reason about, say like arithmetic, and you invent some appropriate vocabulary, and you add in some axioms that are true about what you're reasoning about. I'll give you examples in the next slides. And then you see what these axioms entail, like what are the logical consequences of these axioms. And the, by Gödel's completeness theorem, this is equivalent to what you could just mechanically deduce from these axioms by applying all the, the deduction rule and using the other axioms as much as you can. OK, so for example, uh, suppose you really wanted to reason about arithmetic, which you know, this Italian person, Piano, did back in the late 19th century. So he said, here are you know, the axioms I take to describe arithmetic. There's a constant called 0. There's functions called successor and plus and times. And here are some basic axioms about arithmetic, like for every number x, x times 0 is 0. And once you take these axioms, then you can just see what you can uh, deduce from them. Okay? And that's how you can model reasoning about arithmetic. Another example that we mentioned in lecture three is if you want to reason about set theory, then uh, there's some famous set of axioms for set theory called ZFC. It doesn't matter what it stands for, although I'm going to repeat it a lot, ZFC, ZFC. It's uh, some set of axioms that were jumped up in the early 20th century that you can use to model set theory. Okay? And it has axioms like uh, for all two sets x and y, if x and y have the same elements, then they're the same set. OK. Now, uh, that was like a fun game that mathematicians played back in the early 20th century. And after a while, they noticed something uh, interesting, which is that actually set theory is quite powerful. And you can use just set theory to build up lots of other parts of mathematics. Like you can sort of encode arithmetic with set theory. And then you can encode you know, functions with set theory. And you can encode I don't know, real numbers with set theory. And after a lot of playing around, they actually found that you could encode like all of mathematics, such that you would normally do, just using set theory. And therefore, you could, if you really wanted, sort of translate everything you normally do as a human mathematician into this uh, very simple deductive calculus, starting with these ZFC axioms of set theory. Okay, so for example, you know, I don't know. In this class, we talked about random walks on graphs, which seems to involve a lot of concepts, but if you want, you could define all of these concepts in terms of sets. So it would be a pain, but it would go something like this. Like first, you can define the natural numbers in terms of sets. And then you can define ordered pairs in terms of sets. And graphs are defined in terms of pairs. And the, you know, the rationals, you can think of them as pairs of integers, and blah, 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 blah. Um, so this was something people like, noticed back in the 20s. Like, actually, set theory is like enough math to get you off the ground to start modeling and talking about anything you want in math. <laughs> OK, well, we don't have to worry about this too much. But I'll, again, sort of summarize the upshot of it in a, in a short while. Uh, actually, any questions so far? OK. so. Uh, then we went to lecture four, and we talked about proofs. And uh, I mentioned you know, these two guys, Russell and Whitehead, that actually kind of did this like in the 1910s. They're like, let's do it. Let's like, formalize all of mathematics, starting from like, these seven axioms of set theory and the deductive calculus. And like, they heroically did it. And they like, developed a lot of number theory and calculus, just using you know, from these very basic you know, seven axiom schemas and first order logic. And they convinced people that it was doable, but it was a huge pain, because like, it took them 380 pages to get to 1 plus 1 equals 2. So then they like, stopped, and they're like, man, this was a lot of our time. Uh, but they convinced people that you know, this was doable in principle. 
of course, so nobody, back then nobody wanted to actually continue and do it. They were like, okay, that's fine. Let's just go back to doing math like normal. Um, well, now luckily we have computers, which they did not have back then. So if we want, we actually could work on the project of like taking all the normal mathematical reasoning that we do and trying to actually, you know, encode it like purely like as the deductive calculus applied to the basic axioms of set theory. Okay, it's a big challenge. It's kind of like an engineering challenge in some sense. And in, in lecture four, we talked about this notion of uh, computer-assisted proof, which is actually a very, you know, important and active area of research. Um, there's this notion of a software called a proof assistant. So there are several different ones that are well known. And they do two things. They help you code up, you know, a normal mathematical proof that you would write yourself as a human. Uh, code it up sort of in the, you know, completely formal language of, you know, ZFC and that theory and so forth. And then they also can check that, you know, the, the coded up proof is correct. And it's very simple. It just has to, like, mechanically check that each line is either an axiom. And since we have computable axioms, there's a Turing machine that can check if each line is an axiom. Or if it's supposed to be derived from two previous lines, then that's also syntactically easy to check. Okay, actually, they don't use first order logic. They use some type lambda calculus, but the basic idea is the same. Any questions about this? Do you remember this stuff? Okay, and in fact, they've had big successes. So, uh, I mean, uh, we now have like computer formalized proofs that really literally prove these like well known math theorems, which previously were just proved by humans by normal mathematical means. Like, they're totally rigorously encoded in this, like, deductive logic. You can just syntactically check that they're valid. Okay, all these famous theorems, including one that we're going to prove today. <clears throat> okay. And now, one thing I just want to emphasize, let's take one of these theorems. Like, the, in lecture four, we talked a lot about the four-color theorem, this theorem that if you have a planar graph, it's always possible to four-color it. It's a hard theorem, but, you know, we eventually proved it. Uh, and we know it's, there is a proof of it. It's true. And furthermore, you should, the thing I want you to take away from both this review of lecture three and lecture four is there's a certain Turing machine which will print out and certify a correct proof of the four color theorem coded up in, you know, ZFC plus this deductive calculus. So how does this Turing machine work? Can somebody tell me? It doesn't have to be particularly efficient. In fact, it will be very inefficient. Given that I tell you there is definitely a proof of the four color theorem, how can you mechanically find it? Yes? That's correct. You just try every possible string of length one, two, three, four. I mean, it's probably going to take you up to like a million or something, but at least in a finite amount of time. And, you know, for each string, you can just check whether it's a legal deduction of the four color theorem, you know, in this uh, formalization of mathematics called ZFC. Okay, and since, you know, we know there is a proof, this little algorithm will eventually, you know, find it and certify it. Okay. I think that's all I wanted to remind you of lecture four. Any questions? Okay. All right, let's skip ahead 18 lectures to last lecture, which was about, hopefully it's fresh in your mind, about Turing and computability. <laughs> I'll remind you of a few things we saw last time. Okay, well, we invented this notion of a Turing machine, which is a formalization of an algorithm. And we said a language, L, which is a, a collection of strings, which is associated with a mathematical task or an algorithmic task, is decidable if there's a Turing machine that does two things. First, the Turing machine must have the property that it always halts on every input. Okay, that's one basic fact. And then it should also have the property that it, it accepts the strings that are in the language and rejects the ones that are not in the language. Okay, and so this is what we sort of think of when we say a Turing machine solves an algorithm's problem. And uh, if a language is solved in this way, it's called decidable. Okay, and the major theorem we proved last time was Turing's theorem which gave a particular interesting language, or you can think of it as a computational task, which is not decidable. And it was this task called halts, 
It's this language of all strings, which are encodings of a Turing machine and an input, such that that Turing machine halts when given that input. Or less formally, uh, you know, if I give you the task of taking as input some computer code and an input and trying to decide, will this code halt when given this input? That problem is undecidable. It cannot be solved by any algorithm. Well, it's called the halting problem. And just you know, to remind you of the awesomeness of this statement, it's not like we don't know how to solve it efficiently. It's not like we don't know if you can solve it. Like We know that you cannot solve it by any algorithm. Furthermore, it's such a great theorem that the proof fits on one slide. So I will remind you of the proof. Here's the whole proof. So it's a proof by contradiction. To show this language is undecidable, not decidable, we assume, by way of contradiction, that there is some decider TM, call it M sub halts, which can magically solve this task. Like, it can tell if this code will halt on this input. So we say, OK, suppose this like, amazing machine exists. I'm going to build another algorithm called D, or a Turing machine called D, which uses that as a subroutine. And I'm going to get you know, a program D that's so amazing that it's just a contradiction, which will let us conclude that the original machine cannot exist. OK, so what does this D do? D takes as input the description of one Turing machine, call it M. And it tries to decide, does M halt if you give it its own description as the input? So if you take M and run it on input, the encoding of M, would that halt? And D can easily do this because you know, we're assuming it has access to this amazing subroutine, M sub halts, which can tell if any code halts on any input. OK, so it just has to call this Turing machine, use it as a subroutine to check this. And then it sort of just does the opposite of the answer. If this call accepts, meaning M of M uh, halts, then D will go into some trivial infinite loop. And if the call rejects, then D will just halt. Let's say it accepts, but it doesn't matter. So that's the definition of D. And the punchline comes just by considering, well, what would happen if you ran D on itself as the input? And you see by definition, if you run D on itself, uh, if that actually loops, then D will like learn that and then go, uh, sorry, if it actually halts, then D will, uh, M halts will detect that it halts, and D will go into an infant loop. On the other hand, if it halts, then D will learn that and, wait, well, anyway, it's the opposite, right? If D of D loops, this thing will halt, and if D of D halts, it will loop. OK, so you get a contradiction. It's impossible for the D to do anything. So the only thing that could have gone wrong is this assumption that this machine, which can detect halting, exists. OK, so we're going to see some similar looking proof later today. Uh, do you remember this? Any questions about this? Yeah. Pardon me? Is there a reason why you have to give M? So you give M encoding. Like when you call M halt, you give M encoding. Like are you calling M on its own encoding? Uh, what D does is, OK, M halts is a Turing machine that takes two inputs. It accepts like the encoding of a, expects the encoding of a Turing machine plus just some string. And it's going to you know, understand what that encoded Turing machine is and like simul well, it's going to try to decide if that machine would halt on this string. Okay, so when D gets itself an input of a, the encoding of a Turing machine, it's going to use that as the first parameter for halts. And what string is it going to ask about? The encoding of M itself. Yes, it's essential to the proof somehow, yeah. I mean, in some ways, I mean, this is the easiest, or perhaps only way I can think of proving this theorem. OK. So now we're back to today's lecture. And uh, I should emphasize that, you know, we still have like uh, 50 minutes or something, and it's, there's not that many slides. So feel free, really, to ask questions to make sure you understand everything that's happening. OK, so.
let me start by, you know, at the end of the class last time, you know, we proved that, like, there's no program at all, there's no Turing machine that can solve this halting problem. And if you haven't seen it before, it's kind of surprising, you know, like, it's a, an amazing negative result, and you just maybe, you just don't believe it. Like, how could this problem be that hard? And, you know, it becomes a little harder when you think about, like, okay, how would you do it? Like, how would you try to write a program H, which took two inputs, you know, the encoding of a Turing machine and a string X, and tried to decide if M of X halts or not? In particular, you know, one example I showed you yesterday that, that looks a little bit hard was this. Imagine X is just the empty string, it's irrelevant, and M is the Turing machine or the piece of code that does this. It goes through all the even numbers, checks if... Uh, each number is the sum of two primes, and if it's not, then it halts. Well, as I told you yesterday, it's a, this is a famous open problem in mathematics, whether every even number is the sum of two primes. It seems that it's true, but nobody really knows how to prove it. That's called gold box conjecture. So people believe this program does not halt, because they believe that every even number is the sum of two primes, but you know, as we said last time, maybe not. Maybe just some gigantic even number is not the sum of two primes. We don't know. So maybe this would halt. So it's a kind of a hard problem. Maybe this will help you see that it's kind of a hard problem to decide if a given program with a given input halts or not. Now, I mean, if I'm like a naive person, like how would I try to write this program? At first you're like, it seems like there's only one thing you can do, right? Like, the best idea that like, I could think of would be like, let's just have our program simulate M on the input. That's certainly doable, and it can simulate it for a while, and if it halts, then you're like, great, it halts. And then like, maybe you simulate it for like a billion steps, and like, it still hasn't halted. And then you're not sure what to do, right? You're like, well, it doesn't seem like it's going to halt, but like, you cannot definitively say, like, yep, it doesn't halt, it loops forever. So it's really not clear what you would do at this point. So that's kind of what makes it hard. <clears throat> but if you're a clever person, it's possible to think of a very interesting alternate strategy to try to solve this halting problem. Okay, so, you know, Gödel in the 20s or whatever, third, well, late 20s, had this kind of crazy and awesome idea for, like, how to try to solve the halting problem. Well, okay, the halting problem didn't exist back then. This is actually all before Turing did anything, but... He effectively had this interesting idea, but, you know, he's a mathematician, it was back before there were Turing machines or computers, so it's very confusingly put, so if you, like, let, you know, Turing handle it, he can explain it in a much better way. Uh, so, here's how maybe, you know, a smart person like Turing might try to solve the halting problem. So we are, you know, given a, its input a Turing machine M and an input X, we're trying to decide if M of X halts. Here's an idea. Okay, for K equals 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. And for all strings P of length K, so basically just enumerate all the strings, see if P is a valid proof of the mathematical statement M of X eventually halts. Which you can check with a Turing machine if this string that you just been busy enumerating actually is a correct proof of the statement m of x halts. If it is, then great. I mean, you prove that m of x halts, so you can happily output yes, m of x halts. At the same time in this loop, once you have p, also check if it's a valid proof of the statement m of x eventually loops. Okay? And if it is, you're like, wow, I like lucked into this proof that m of x eventually loops. So I can happily just stop and say, no, m of x does not halt. Okay, and then just keep going. Keep searching for bigger and bigger strings, hoping you find one that is a proof that m of x halts or a proof that m of x loops. Do you have a question? Well, we're going to talk about this exact issue. Actually, we're almost there. So I'll hold your question for a second. Um, okay, this is a very clever idea for trying to solve the halting problem. However, it's not going to work. Why? No, we, there's a reason we know it will not work. Why? Well, let's start with the first half of it. Uh, we proved, last class, Turing proved that this program 
like all programs, does not solve the halting problem. There is no pro pro program that solves the halting problem. That's a fact. So in particular, this proof, does, this algorithm, does not solve the halting problem. But, OK, you guys are both getting at it. What does that mean? It means, I mean, it's only going to make a mistake if this thing runs forever and doesn't find a proof of anything. So if this program doesn't solve the halting problem, it means there's some input, a Turing machine M and a string X, such that this thing just loops forever and neither finds a proof of M of X eventually halts or a proof of M of X eventually loops. Right? So uh, that's kind of it. Like, uh, a conclusion is just what I said. There is some Turing machine M and some string X such that, you know, in this fixed formal system for doing math, let's say ZFC with this deductive calculus that so far for the first like 100 years seem to be great at proving whatever you want, uh, it can neither prove M of X eventually halts or M of X eventually loops. But I mean, m of x either halts or loops, right? I mean, it does something. One of these two statements is true. So, I mean, that means there's a true statement of math which cannot be proved, let's say, in this ZFC with deductive calculus. Neat. Uh, any question about that? Uh, yes? Uh, not really. We'll come back to that. It's very similar to the other halting problem. Yeah. Yeah? That's a good question. The question was, does this hold for every logical system? I'll get to that in uh, like one or two slides. In fact, let me just, maybe even the next slide, or soon. So this is basically Gödel's first incompleteness theorem. There is a true statement which you cannot prove, let's say, with this ZFC and deductive calculus. I mean, the basic formalization of math. That's pretty cool. <clears throat> uh, right. So actually, there's a slight bug in this proof. Uh, I've cheated you a little bit. Because actually, this conclusion is not quite right. There is one possibility that we did not take into account. Can anybody see what we missed? Uh, the other possibility is that in this you know, formalization of math, ZFC and deductive calculus, maybe there is a proof of the statement m of x eventually halts even though it loops. Or perhaps there's a proof of m of x eventually loops even though it halts. Okay? Perhaps there is a proof of a fault, like a proof of a false statement. That's possible. We don't think that you can prove false statements using the basic rules we've established for math, but it's possible. Okay, and if that were true, we, the technical term is we'd call ZSC unsound. It could prove some statements that are false. Now, that would be very, very, very surprising. Uh, I think essentially almost nobody believes that this uh, is true, that ZFC is unsound, that you can start with these seven axioms of set theory and use the deductive calculus and like get something that's false. Uh, theoretically, it's a possibility. Uh, well, okay. It depends whether what you feel about uh, the meaning of truth. This is not a joke, right? I mean, uh, so ZFC, you can use ZFC to deduce some very surprising things, which you may think are so surprising that you would think these axioms are too strong and maybe we should eliminate them. But we'll see a sort of a substitute for soundness later. I think most people don't think that you can prove a statement and also prove the negation of that statement using ZFC. We'll get to that in a second. Um, but actually, what would happen if this like one in a trillion chance happened and like somehow ZFC was broken? 
Nothing really. We would just change the basic rules. We'd be like, oh, I guess we, those seven axioms were not a good choice. Let's try to fix them up into something different that more correctly models mathematics and the world. But anyway, most people don't think this will happen. So, but this is technically a possibility, so we're going to have to allow it in the statement of the theorem. OK, so here's what we've actually proven so far. Uh, CFC with deductive calculus cannot be both complete and sound. Okay, what it complete means the following. For every sentence S, you can either prove S or you can prove the negation of S. Okay? That's what complete means. For every sentence, you can either prove the sentence or you can prove its negation. And sound means it doesn't prove false things. In other words, if S is provable, then S has to be actually true. OK, any questions? As I said, we have lots of time. So. There's still maybe a few things that bother you about this statement. So I'll, I'll continue to say a few more things. Again, stop me if you have a question. So let me address your question, actually. Uh, to what extent did this proof really use a ZFC? Like, how much did it actually rely on like, you know, those seven axioms for set theory that were fixed at the beginning and the rules of deductive calculus? Uh, the answer is not that much. Actually, if you look at the proof that we just saw, uh, what do you really need about ZFC? It just has to be sort of expressive enough that you can talk about st statements involving Turing machines. Okay, you just have to have like enough you know, vocabulary so that you can like encode talking about Turing machines and stuff. <clears throat> and through experience, we've learned that you know, ZFC has plenty I mean, of power, uh, descriptive power. You know, ZFC seems to allow us to describe more or less anything we want in all of mathematics. It can certainly handle talking about Turing machines. Um, OK, so there's actually one other property. You need that it. You can define Turing machines in this formal language. And you also need that its axioms or axiom schema, it has axiom schema, meaning you know, rules for infinitely many axioms. They have to be computable. Because you know, when we're checking whether a statement is a valid proof of something, we have to check whether each line is either a deduction, which is easy, it's just modus ponens, or whether it's an axiom. And so since there are infinitely many axioms, you have to like, do some kind of pattern matching to see if it you know, fits into the axiom schema. Okay, so the axiom schemas have to be computable. Does that make sense? It's a bit of a more technical point. <clears throat> okay, so you see, it's nothing overly special about ZFC as long as it's like uh, you know reasonable enough that you can tell what's an axiom in it and what's not, and it, it's expressive enough that it can talk about Turing machines. You can prove the same theorem. So uh, you can state Gödel's theorem a little more generally like this. Any mathematical proof system which is sufficiently expressive, meaning it can define TNs and has computable axioms, cannot be both complete and sound. Complete means for every sentence you can either prove the sentence or its negation. Sound means everything you can prove is true. And it's actually important that you phrase it this way in terms of sort of an arbitrary sort of formal language for proofs. Uh, as we'll see in a second. As one side remark, you know, I remember I told you this piano arithmetic, which is some axioms you can use to reason about natural numbers. Turns out even that is sufficiently expressive because if like you really like into like hacking and doing crazy stuff, you can like encode Turing machines by like arithmetic of natural numbers, by like, you know, you code lists by like the exponents and primes and like there's a lot of painful hacking around. And actually Gödel himself had to do all this because the idea of computers and Turing machines did not exist when he was giving the proof, but uh, you know this is too painful to care about, and so we'll just stick with powerful systems like ZFC. <laughs> yes.
Yeah, I agree. It is uh, important to know that you can encode Turing machines even in piano arithmetic because piano arithmetic is really like particularly simple and you know it's only reasoning about natural numbers so it, uh, it sort of says that even there are you know true statements about the natural numbers like arithmetic of natural numbers which cannot be proved um, in fact you know it's also an active area of research to even like peel away piano arithmetic and get like some even crazy like simpler system uh, where Gödel's first incompleteness theorem still holds some like really simple language of proof in mathematics where you can still prove this theorem. Uh, for example, you know, if you go too far, we saw, and like I told you in lecture three, that if you are interested in reasoning about Euclidean geometry, like two-dimensional geometry, then Tarski invented, uh, you know, a, a set of axioms for reasoning about that, which is complete and sound. It just literally exactly proves all theorems that are true. So, you know, it's possible to have a complete and sound system, but like once you have enough expressive power that you can sort of encode talking about computation, then you've gone too far. And you get you run into Gödel's theorem. <clears throat> okay, so uh, before I you know continue to delve into the philosophy of it, um, here's how a smart aleck might try to get around Gödel's first incompleteness theorem. Okay, so this is in the smart Alex voice. So let's assume ZFC is sound. So it doesn't prove any false statements. Everybody believes that, uh, more or less. Uh, so Gödel's theorem that there's some true statement S which you cannot prove. Fine. So just add it as an axiom. You know, it's true. So why not? Just take, a, take it as an additional axiom, whatever this sentence is. Why does this not really solve anything? Yeah? Exactly, exactly. So, I mean, well, you've just taken ZFC and, like, added an extra axiom. Uh, it's still sufficiently expressive and has computable axioms. If you want to check if something is an axiom, just check if it's an axiom of ZFC or if check if it literally equals S. So you can just apply Gödel's theorem again and get some other sentence, S prime, which is true but can't be proved. So, okay, you can start to fight a losing battle, right? You can be like, Let's in add S prime as another axiom. It's true, right? Well, same dilemma. You know, it still doesn't help. You can take your system to be ZFC with S and S prime as additional axioms. And assuming this is still sound, there'll be another true statement which uh, cannot be proved. Does it make sense? Now, if you're a real smart aleck, you can just say, well, how about I just take all the true sentences and add them in as axioms? This is actually not ridiculous. This is, uh, you know, this is a move that's done in uh, logic sometimes. But why does not really that get around anything or resolve anything? Yeah. Yeah. The trouble is, you just added. You can do it, but you just add in like an infinite set of axioms. And like, if I give you a sentence, like, you, there's no obvious way to check whether it's an axiom, right? You can check if it's an axiom of ZFC. That's not a problem. But then if you have to check whether it's a true statement, so how are you going to do that? So it's fine. You know, it'll just, if you go back to Gödel's theorem, you know, you cannot apply Gödel's theorem because you won't have this hypothesis anymore that all the axioms are computable. OK, it doesn't really make sense to have like a, a, you know, a deductive system for mathematics where the axioms are not computable because how can you tell if a proof is valid or not if you can't even check if a sentence is an axiom? <clears throat> okay. Any questions so far? Okay. Hmm, we may get done early. Uh, all right, now here's an objection that you may have. I would have it if I, when, let's say when I saw this the first few times, dozen times. Uh, you know, I said, what, I said, what is the definition of sound? I said, a system is sound if for every S, if it's provable, then it's true. Okay? And that's a little weird because you might be like, what does this mean? Complete is no problem, right? Complete just means you cannot prove S and negation of S. That's kind of a clear definition. 
But what about this sound? Like, you might be like, whoa, like, what does it mean to be true? Like, I thought, like, something was true if you could prove it. So, like, how could you say a sentence is true if you can't prove it, man? Uh, sort of a valid point. Um, however, there's two responses to this, this objection. Okay, I'll give you the two responses. Response number one is as follows, like, just don't get all confused, like, it's okay. Like, yesterday, if I came up to you and I was like, hey, is it true that like, I don't know, one is the only number which is in Pascal's triangle more than 10 times? You wouldn't be like, whoa, man, what is true? You'd be like, <laughs> I don't know, let me, let me, maybe, yes, no, it's either yes or no, let me see if I can figure out. It's okay, like, Ordinary mathematical concepts and language and reasoning do not suddenly go out the window just because you're decided you're studying logic, you know? Logic is just a branch of math, you know, about manipulating symbols. So, I mean, you don't have to forget, like, you know what true means just because you're studying logic. Okay. Um, does that satisfy you? I got some yeses and some noes. Uh, how about the noes? It doesn't satisfy you? Yeah, you have a comment? So, is this definition of true more robust because it seems like it's true? Um, so, is this a systematic way to decide true or false? Do you decide true? Well, yes. The question is could you decide if something is true or false in a systematic way other than just being like, oh, I believe it? Yeah. You can prove it in a stronger proof system. That sounds like cheating, but hold, hold off for a second. Suppose I was like, I'm going to formalize like, reasoning about natural numbers, uh, you know, and just have like six axioms, and like, hopefully that'll capture natural numbers. And so like, I, you know, I write down piano's axioms from way back here, but like, I just, well, never mind. I write down piano's axioms, but I just like, forget some of them. Like, I just omit some of them. Uh, that would still be a formal, oops, that would still be a formal system. Let me get back to where I was. Um, but maybe like it would not have like enough axioms to like help me prove things that are true. Like one of the axioms in uh, piano arithmetic is about induction. It lets you do induction. And if you don't put it in, then you can sort of only prove, you can never prove a statement like, you know, uh, for all something, you know, like for all, uh, Numbers, so the number is either prime or composite. You can't prove it if you don't have induction because you don't have enough expressive power to talk about, you know, all integers simultaneously. Nevertheless, you know, we kind of agree that it's true that every number is prime or composite. We just, you know, didn't put enough power into our axioms to deduce this. So it may be that, like, you know, there's some things that we agree are true based on ordinary mathematical reasoning, but we just didn't put enough axioms in our system to actually be able to deduce it. So, yes, that's right. By putting in additional axioms, you're sort of refining your notion of what is true. Like, if you don't put in enough axioms, it might not, see, what happens with first order logic is you have something in mind, like maybe Euclidean geometry, and then you put in some axioms, like, you know, if uh, y is between x and z, and x equals z, then y equals x. You know, like, that's an axiom because it's true about what I have in mind. But, you know, if you only put in a few such axioms, you might not really fully capture Euclidean geometry. So, yeah. So, it could be that a statement is true and we have, like, a proof that makes us believe it, but, like, we just can't formalize that proof with ZFC. In which case, it would be reasonable to add more axioms to ZFC so that we could formalize it. Yeah, now we're kind of getting in philosophy, but I mean, okay, my philosophy is why do you do math? Because you, it's like helping you reason about the real world. So if you invent some mathematical rules and they don't capture, they don't help you reason about the real world, then you can change the rules. That's okay. What? Yeah. 
Well, nevertheless, these are a difficult questions. So uh, there's response two. And response two was given by Girdle, and he was like, you know what? Like, I can tell I, this is going to be a hornet's nest. So let me just prove a stronger statement, which does not even mention true. So like, it'll be totally unambiguous, this statement, what it means. OK, and this is maybe the full version or strong version of Girdle's first incompleteness theorem. Actually, he didn't manage to prove this. He proved some like, weirdo version of it, but Barclay Rosser subsequently fixed it. So this is the full version. It looks very similar, just the last word is different. It's that any mathematical proof system which is sufficiently expressive and has computable axioms cannot be both complete and consistent. We don't say complete and sound, complete and consistent. But what does consistent mean? Complete means uh, for every sentence you can either prove S or not S. Consistent just means you cannot prove both S and not S. Okay. Uh, so if a system is sound, like you can't prove false theorems, and you definitely cannot prove both S and not S, but not the other way around. But this is good because this is totally syntactic, right? You don't have to reference truth or anything. You just, uh, it just says that you can't prove a statement and its negation. OK, so this, if you had a system that was both complete and consistent, that would be great because it would say for every sentence, you can either prove the sentence or its negation, but not both. So you can sort of totally resolve that sentence as long as you believe that your system is capturing truth. <clears throat> OK, so actually, we're going to prove this better theorem, too, because it's, you know, it's sort of unquestionable. You can't quibble about what does true mean. Okay, any questions about the statement? OK, so it's only a tiny bit harder. And the proof is very simple. And so not only will we prove it, there will be a plot twist at the end. So do not fall asleep. OK, and like, I don't want to talk about a sufficiently as whatever expressible system, so let me just say it's ZFC from now on. <coughs> OK, so here is the outline of the previous proof. We assume for contradiction that uh, ZFC was sound. Or sorry, well, we assume that ZFC is sound. Then we reasoned about a certain Turing machine, and we deduced that ZFC had to be incomplete. There had to be some statement about Turing machines halting that it could not prove. So our upcoming stronger proof is going to be almost the same. We're going to assume that ZFC is consistent, reason about a certain Turing machine, and deduce that ZFC is incomplete. Okay, so that means ZFC cannot be both incomplete, sorry, cannot be both complete and consistent. Okay, we're going to need a small lemma in order to do this. So I'll give the lemma on the next slide, but uh, to warm up for the lemma, I want to tell you that, you know, although I've been telling you, yes, there are true statements that you cannot prove, there are some true statements that are so simple that you can just look at them and say, all right, this one does have a proof for sure. Okay, it's like not so crazy. You can be sure that it has a proof, assuming it's true. All right, an example of such a statement is like this. There are 25 primes less than 100. Like, that's true. I, I promise you, I, I counted them. So, you know, if I put that on your homework, and so do you have some confidence that it's true, otherwise I wouldn't assign it, uh, you kind of breathe a sigh of relief, right? Because you kind of know, like, I can definitely prove this in the worst case by just, like, literally listing all the numbers less than 100 and, like, manually checking, like, each one, whether it's prime or not. Okay? It's like, you can look at the statement, and somehow, because you can just see, you only have to check a finite number of things, that there's going to be some kind of, you know, brute force, brain dead proof of it. So you look at this thing and you say, okay, at least I don't have to worry about this being one of the sentences that, you know, does not have a proof. So uh, let me give an important class of sentences like that have this property. So I'll call this the brain dead lemma. We'll use it on uh, the next couple of slides. It says this: suppose you have a particular Turing machine and it has a particular execution trace for t steps. Then there does exist a proof of that fact that it has this particular execution trace in the language of ZFC. Okay, so I mean, uh, can somebody tell me what the proof would look like? If I said to you, like, prove that this particular Turing machine with this particular input, like, after 100 steps, you know, looks like this, like, what would you do? Yeah? Yeah, 
Yeah. Yes, that's right. You could, for example, try all the execution states and, and check them, but it's even easier. You can just, yeah, you can just like literally do it. Like if like push came to shove, you could be like, well, but the first line of my proof is like, by definition, M starts out with the blank tape in state Q0 and the head at the left. Then by definition, after one step, it's in this configuration. And then by definition, like after two steps, it's in this configuration. And after T steps, you'd be like, therefore, it's in the configuration that was claimed QED. Okay, somehow, like, this is almost too simple to, like, uh, say. But, you know, there are some things that are so simple that, like, they definitely have proofs. <clears throat> in particular, this is taking it one step, uh, one th step to the next level. But if you have some Turing machine and it halts on some input x, there's always going to be a proof of the statement m of x halts. Okay, because, you know, if I put on your homework, show that this Turing machine halts on this string, and, you know, I sort of promise you that it's true, you could be like, well, in the worst case, like, I'll just literally write down the, like, all the states it's in, and it eventually halts, so, like, I will eventually have a finite proof that it halts. You know, I'll just exhibit the whole execution history. Yeah, I definitely get full credit on the homework. Okay, any questions about this? We're going to use it at like a key moment. Okay, so let's, we're almost there. We're all, let's going to prove the, the full version of Gödel's first incompleteness theorem. The one that, you know, it's stronger because it doesn't even mention proof, uh, mention truth. And remember, you can think of it as saying like uh, ZFC, or any proof system that's expressive enough and has computable axioms cannot be both consistent and complete. And how are we going to prove it? We're going to assume that it's consistent and show that it must be incomplete by reasoning about a certain Turing machine. OK, plan is clear. Statement is clear. It's just me a couple of slides. OK, so here it is, the proof. So as I said, let's assume ZFC is consistent. Remember, that means uh, for every statement, it, it does not prove both the statement and the negation. So I told you we we're going to reason about a certain Turing machine. Here it is. This is the whole Turing machine that we're going to reason about. So what does it do? It's a Turing machine called D. And it takes one input, which you know is the encoding of some other Turing machine, M. And it's like in the last proof, it's going to try to sort of try to decide if M halts when given itself as the input just by searching for proofs. Okay, so it's going to go through all strings of length one, two, three, four, but then also do the opposite, right? So in fact, the proof so far is the same as last time. It's going to check if it found a string that's a proof that M halts when run on itself then it'll go into some trivial Turing machine state that just like loops forever by just having the head always go to the right. And if it finds a proof that M, uh, when run on itself, loops, then it'll just halt. OK? So by doing a small amount of reasoning, we're going to deduce that uh, ZFC is incomplete. It'll be sort of just like before. <clears throat> OK, so the. Uh, Punchline comes by asking, using the, you know, the, the logic of ZFC, what statements could you possibly prove about the action of D running on itself as input? Well, first let's use the hypothesis. The hypothesis says that ZFC is consistent, which means it cannot prove a statement and its negation. So, by this assumption, we know that ZFC can prove at most one of the statements, D of D halts or D of D loops, right? These are the negations of each other. Okay, so we know it can prove at most one. So, you know, it's not like there's a proof it can find for this line and a proof it can find for this line. It can only, there's at most one it can find. So, let's see, which one might it be able to prove? In fact, we'll shortly show that actually it cannot prove either of them. But just by ruling out the two possibilities, we'll show that. OK, 
Okay, so this, the slightly easier possible possibility to rule out is this one, the D of D loops. So let us ask ourselves, is it possible that there is a proof in ZFC that D, when run on itself as input, loops? <coughs> well, what do you think? Yeah? Well, you, before we just said, you know, if D of D loops, then it halts. But we don't actually know that D of D loops. We're just assuming there exists a proof that D of D loops. Yeah? Well, let's think about it a little bit more. I mean, suppose ZFC can prove that D of D loops. So what will happen when you actually run D on D? Well, it'll start looking for proofs of the statement D of D halts or proofs of the statement D of D loops. Now, at most one of those exists by this line. And we're imagining that this one does exist, that there's a proof that D of D loops. So definitely D, when run on D, will hit this part, which means that it will halt. Okay? So D, on input D, if you start running this, it will find this proof. It won't find this proof by consistency, and so it will halt. But that means that D of D, if D of D halts, we saw from the previous slide by like the brain dead lemma that there's also a proof of that fact in ZFC. Because whenever you have a Turing machine and a string, and the Turing machine halts on that string, it's very easy to prove that fact. Okay, there exists a proof. So we sort of show that if D of D halts, then there exists a proof that D of D halts by the brain dead lemma. But that's a contradiction, because then we would have that ZFC can prove D of D loops, and ZFC can prove D of D halts, which contradicts consistency. This is like the key step in the proof. There's one more case, but it's basically the same. So let me pause. Uh, any question about that? Do you understand all the sub-steps of this, this part of the argument? Okay, so great. So we know it proves at most one of these two statements, and we just ruled out the possibility that it can prove D of D loops. So let's also show that it can't prove D of D halts. Very slightly trickier. So I don't know, could it prove that D of D halts? Well, again, we know it proves at most one of them, so it's never going to hit, if you run D with itself as input, it's never going to hit uh, this line. So it will hit this line, because if we assume that there is a proof of this, and then it'll go into this like trivial state in the Turing machine that just always goes right and makes it loop forever. But I claim, in this case, there will again be a proof of the fact in ZFC that D of D loops forever. Because we know that if you run D on D, what happens is it goes for some finite number of steps T, and then it goes into this trivial infinite loop step. So again, by the brain-dead lemma, there is a proof of that fact. It's simple enough that you can prove it. You just say, look, the first t steps, it does this. And then on the t plus first step, it goes into this infinite loop step. Therefore, it loops forever. Okay, it is sometimes possible to show that a Turing machine running on a certain input loops forever. And in this case, it's so simple that you can be sure there is a proof. Okay, and then you would, we conclude that ZFC can prove D of D loops, then then we have it's proving both that D of D loops and D of D halts. Okay. Is that all right? Any question about that? Okay, now we're done. So that's it. We just showed that ZFC cannot prove D of D loops, nor can it prove D of D halts. So it's incomplete. There's a sentence, let's say D of D loops, where you cannot prove that sentence, nor can you prove its negation. OK, 
so that's the end of the proof of the strong version of Gödel's first incompleteness theorem that in ZFC or any formal system that's powerful enough and has computable axioms, you cannot be both consistent and complete. If you're consistent, we hope you're consistent because otherwise it's a bad formal system, then you cannot be complete. It's not the case that every sentence you can either prove it or disprove it. <clears throat> okay, time for the plot twist. Between you and me, and incidentally, what is the truth of the matter? Does D of D actually halt, or does D of D actually loop? Here's D. Run it with its own, you know, encoding of itself as the input. Will it loop, or will it halt? Let me wait until I get some other opinions. <laughs> Okay, now two people want to venture an answer. Three. Okay, so I'll ask the first person. Yes. Is that what you were going to say? Yeah. It uh, actually loops, right? We just showed that, well, uh, according, seemingly, we just showed that, you know, either, uh, it, you know, you cannot prove that it loops or you cannot prove that it halts in ZFC. So it'll never find a proof of either of these. All right, so it'll just go forever. Are you going to spoil the punchline? Okay, well, don't do it then. Okay. Uh, okay, so I mean, we just showed the ZFC does not prove that it loops or that it halts, D of D. So this D, when you give it D, it'll just run forever. So it loops. Great. Uh, are you going to spoil the punchline? Are you going to spoil the punchline? Great. Do you have a question? <laughs> Very funny. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, OK, so wait, did I interpret that correctly? Were you making a joke, or was that a question? Got it. Sorry. <laughs> I need like joke explainer here, yes, okay, I'm, I'm cool with that. Great, so uh, you know, together we all collectively agreed, uh, mathematically, that it loops. Right, but wait, why don't we just write that proof down? And you know, it'll be in normal mathematical language, but we know we can encode it into ZFC or whatever, right? So we just showed that D of D loops. So if we encode these last three slides in ZFC, we do get a proof that D of D loops even though we proved that we cannot prove that D of D loops. So did we just find a contradiction in mathematics? That's allowing us to cancel the rest of the class? Yes? yes? No. Oh, well, no. Uh, I tricked you a little bit. Uh, we did not. We just reasoned, uh, you know, for the last two minutes that uh, actually D of D loops. So we're like, oh, actually, we just proved that D of D actually loops. But that was wrong. We did not just prove that D of D loops. Uh, because we forgot one thing that's on the slide. There's an assumption up here. Assume ZFC is consistent. Okay. We use that in the proof. We use that critically in our whole analysis of everything. The assumption that ZFC was consistent to show that, like, you know, there's not a proof of this and this for D. So we did not prove that, you know, human mathematically speaking, we did not prove that D of D loops. We proved that assuming ZFC is consistent, D of D loops. Is that okay? Okay, you, you see how I've stopped cheating you? Like, that, this is true. Any questions about that? OK, so <clears throat> we have a proof that if, of this statement. And for now, squint your eyes for a second. It looks like there's a lot of amazing things going on in there. But it's just a statement of the form A implies B. OK? A is this statement. ZFC is consistent. 
B is this statement, D of D loops. And we just showed that indeed there's a proof that A implies B. Uh, let us further assume that ZFC is actually consistent, because otherwise all of mathematics is bogus. Once we assume that ZFC is consistent, this is fine. So we know that ZFC cannot prove D of D loops. Okay, that was what we called sentence B. So we know that we have a proof of A implies B, and we have, there is not a proof of B. Okay, we know that, uh, assuming ZFC is consistent, you can prove this implication, but you cannot prove the, the consequent. So what is the only thing that we can deduce? No, not that ZFC is not consistent, but close. Uh, yes? Correct. ZFC cannot prove A, this part, right? We know that ZFC can prove A implies B, but it can't prove B. So it better not be able to prove A, because if you can prove A and you can prove A implies B, then you can definitely prove B. It's just one application of modus ponens. So the only possibility is that ZFC cannot prove this part, the hypothesis. The statement ZFC is consistent. Okay, that is basically the end of the plot twist. Uh, is there a question about that? Because that was full of subtle reasoning. So, uh, yes? The question was, is there any system that can prove ZFC is consistent? Uh, yes. But let me, let's talk about that after, for example. <clears throat> yeah? Uh, I'm not sure. Really, all of this was predicated on assuming that ZFC was consistent. Because, and you can tell that that's necessary, because if ZFC is not consistent, what does that mean? It means there's some statement A such that you can prove A and not A. If that's true, then actually you can prove any statement at all, right? If you want to prove statement C, you know, it's like if you have a contradiction, you can prove anything. If you want to prove statement C, you just like, assume for a Contradiction that not C. Well, we have a contradiction, A and not A, therefore C. I mean, it's valid. It's a valid mathematical deduction. So it's just saying that if you have an inconsistent system that can prove a stens and its negation, then actually it can prove everything. So uh, if ZFC is inconsistent, then you can prove everything. So I mean, can't prove that you cannot prove something. Right? It can prove everything. So we always sort of assume that ZFC is consistent, and then we can deduce that ZFC cannot prove that fact. Okay, so to summarize, this is Gödel's second incompleteness theorem, which he proved a little later. Also, von Neumann proved it independently of him. Uh, and here it is. Assume that ZFC is uh, consistent, or it works with any sufficiently expressive proof system then not only is it incomplete, that's the first theorem, but here's a particular statement, a true statement, but there's a particular statement that it cannot prove. ZFC is consistent. Okay, so it's a lot like Turing's theorem. Remember, when we were talking about undecidability, we were like, well, if you're just asking, is there an undecidable language, it's easy to prove that there's an undecidable language because there's only countably many deciding Turing machines, but there's uncountably many languages. So one of them has to be undecidable. But, you know, that's not an interesting language. That doesn't give you an interesting language that's undecidable. And so sort of Gödel's second theorem is like that to Gödel's first theorem. Gödel's first theorem just tells you, you know, take ZFC, assume it's consistent. There's some sentence which you can't prove. And the second incompleteness the theorem is saying, like, here's a very interesting sentence which in particular, you cannot prove. And that interesting sentence itself is the sentence ZFC is consistent. So that's, you know, like the, <laughs> the yeah, Gödel's second incompleteness theorem. Uh, OK, that's it. Uh, <laughs> any questions? Okay, see you uh, on Thursday. <laughs>